All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for saving us from our sins and gathering us all here together. Lord, we pray with the Apostle Paul a very bold prayer. We pray that you would fill us now with all the fullness of God. Lord, lead us into your truth. Lord, pierce our hearts and help us to have compassion for those who need it most. Help us in all things to show the love of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the classic epic, The Lord of the Rings, there is a very old forest called Fangorn Forest. This isn't any ordinary forest. It has these caretakers, these tree-like creatures called Ents. The Ents are peace-loving creatures, and they stay out of the wars of men. But in the time of the Lord of the Rings, the war has come to them. Saruman, the great white wizard, used to love to walk in the forest. But now that he has joined the war effort on the side of evil... He no longer cares for forests and trees. He now loves building armies and war machines out of iron and steel. And in order to forge armor, shields, swords, and all sorts of weapons of war, he needs to burn lots and lots of wood in order to keep his furnaces hot. And where does he get the wood from? Fangorn Forest. The Ents are caught in a terrible situation where they don't want to fight in a war. They want to just live in peace and tend to their forest. But as they hide from battle and keep to themselves, the fires keep burning and the trees keep falling. If things continue as they are, they may find one day that there's no more forest to dwell in. Now, I share this story because I think it's a great example of what can happen in churches. In fact, I know it has happened in churches, and it is happening right now. A peaceful life is a good thing to desire, but a peaceful life can become an idol. Back in the 90s, the musician Rich Mullins once said, the ultimate goal for many Christians is to live in a pretty little house with their pleasant little family in a peaceful little neighborhood where you don't have to run into any gays or drug addicts. Too often, we can get caught up in our Christianized version of the American dream and forget that there is work to be done that Christ created us to do. If we live as if all our faith demands of us is to play church on Sundays and be nice to people during the week, we're not going to reach the lost for Christ. We're not going to succeed in raising our kids in the faith, and we're probably not going to last as a church. So that's why we need to look to Christ. In the first place, it's Christ who saves us. It's Christ who left us with a job to do. And it's Christ who strengthens us and guides us to do the job that he gave us to do. And if we're going to make a difference for Christ, it will start with us looking to him and learning to raise up people and to raise up leaders like he did. Now, Pastor Mark preached a sermon two weeks ago called, Why Lead Like Jesus? Today, we're going to look at how to lead like Jesus. We're going to get right into it. So how did Jesus train up leaders? So first of all, Jesus called disciples to fulfill a mission. Jesus called disciples to fulfill a mission. Let me read for you Matthew 4, 18 through 20. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So Jesus' plan from the beginning was to raise up others. Isn't that interesting to think about? Jesus didn't do his earthly ministry alone. From the very beginning, he gathered followers. He gathered disciples. 
Uh, it was his master plan to invest his time, his energy, and his very life into a handful of ordinary men. Jesus' earthly ministry was not a one-man show. Now, think about the type of people Jesus was reaching. Fishermen? Uh, come on, Jesus, if you want to make a difference, maybe you should get to know some kings or some military leaders or maybe Caesar himself. But the, the wisdom of our Lord, it's so different from the wisdom of man. When our Lord chose the twelve, he chose regular people, people without positions of power or stature, people with obvious flaws like zealots, like tax collectors, the focus of Jesus' ministry was not large movements or political parties. His focus was individual people. So Christ, here's a quote from uh, the church father John Chrysostom. He said, Christ had the power to set the human race free. He succeeded in doing this with no force of arms, nor expenditure of money, nor by starting wars of conquest, nor by fl inflaming men to battle. He had only 11 men to start with, men who are undistinguished, without learning, ill-informed, destitute, poorly clad, without weapons or sandals, men who had but a single tunic to wear. These are the type of people Jesus called to his mission. So, I wanted to start with that, because if you're thinking, oh, this sermon's about leadership, I'm not really a leader, so this sermon probably isn't for me. Don't think that. Jesus called ordinary people to be his disciples, and he called the least likely people to be his apostles. Think about that. I don't care how inadequate or ill-equipped you feel, how old or young you may be, you never know what plans God has in store for you to fulfill his mission. Uh, an anonymous church father said, Just as an artist who sees precious and not rough-hewn stones, he chooses them, not because of what they are, but because of what they can become. And that's how it is with Jesus. He doesn't pick perfect people. He takes ordinary people, sinful people, and he transforms them to be what he's called to be. And so, even though this is a sermon on leaders, and you might not feel like a leader, this is still a sermon for you, because God calls ordinary people to do his work. All right, so the second part of how Jesus trained up leaders was Jesus invited them to watch him and to minister alongside of him. So in Matthew 4, 23, it says this, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So as Jesus ministered, his disciples went with him and they were able to watch Jesus proclaim the kingdom and care for the sick and the afflicted. By the way, the rest of Matthew 4, so that's Matthew 4, up until Matthew 10, all it's doing there is describing Jesus' ministry what he was preaching, what he was doing, the people he's caring for, the people he's healing. And all that time, all this ministry he's doing, the disciples are right there with him. Now think about this. It says he ministers in all of Galilee. So there are about, at that time, 240 villages in Galilee. And the villages were mostly very small. But there's 240 villages in Galilee. And uh, scholars believe Jesus... Uh, went to all of them at least twice, as far as we can tell from the Scriptures. So think about that. Jesus is traveling from village to village, and he's preaching the, the good news that the king, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And where the sick people are, he's healing them. People are demon-possessed, he's casting out demons, and he's going through all of Galilee, and he's doing this. So... Think about all the time Jesus got to, the disciples got to see Jesus do ministry. They got to see him preach, and oftentimes the same sermons. They had to hear him over and over again. And they got to see him care for hundreds of people, 
possibly thousands of people. So a huge part of their training was just being with Jesus as he did ministry. So often we observe a son who walks and moves just like his father. You'll see a kid, he grows up, and you might have known the dad, but then you see this kid and he's a teenager now, and you're like, wow, he reminds me so much of his dad. (laughs) Because they walk the same and they talk the same. Well, that's because of all the time the son has spent in the presence of his father. He picks up his father's traits, whether consciously or not. And so, too, this is part of Jesus' training for his disciples. They're going with him as Jesus is preaching, as Jesus is ministering, and they get to see and just observe what he does and serve alongside of him. So Jesus didn't call the disciples to be fishers of men and say, now here's how you're going to become fishers of men. I want you to come to a service with me once a week, and in about three years, you're going to be ready. (laughs) No, that's not how it went. He invited them to come alongside of him and experience the deepest trenches of ministry and the highest mountains of joy when fruit for the kingdom was born. So we see the first step, Jesus called them to a mission. He says, you're going to be fishers of men. And the second step, Jesus invited them to watch him and minister alongside of him. Now our third step, Jesus sent the 12 away to minister themselves. So uh, we have a few passages here. So Jesus gives instructions and he sends out the twelve. So Matthew 10, 1, it says, And he called to him his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every disease and every affliction. So he gives them the power to do the kinds of things that he has been doing. I'm going to skip to Matthew 10, 5. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Now I'm going to read for you Luke 9, 1 through 6. Uh, which is the corollary gospel where Jesus gives uh, instructions again. And he called the twelve together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. There's there's three observations I want to make here. So first of all, uh, they were sent in pairs. Uh, um, That one is easy to miss. But when he lists the, the um, disciples, he lists them in pairs. And so we're, I think we can assume he sent them in pairs. And we'll see later, Jesus has his practice of sending people in pairs. So Jesus sent them in pairs. And now think about that. So when Jesus went and ministered uh, to all of Galilee, these 240 villages, you had one Jesus to 240 villages. So that was your ratio of ministers, right? One Jesus to 240 villagers. Well, now he's sending out the 12 in pairs. So now you have six teams, right? Uh, Six partners. So if you break down the 240, now you get 40. Now you get one team per 40 villages. And so um, of the apostles proclaiming the kingdom to the villages of Galilee. So the the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry has actually increased. So uh, B, another observation, their mission was limited in scope. So notice, he doesn't expect them to do exactly what he did. So Jesus is one Jesus to 240 villages, right? He doesn't say, all right, now you be just like me. They weren't ready to be just like Jesus. He's like, I'm going to give you a limited job. You're going to go to your 40 villages. And he gave them instructions, right? He said, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, just go to the Israelites, right? 
And when they were done, um, that, that was it. That's the third point. They reported to Jesus after the mission was complete. So it was a mission with limited scope. So think about this. He gave them instructions. He gave them a smaller job to do than what he did himself. Um, and then when they were done, they came back and reported to Jesus. So uh, John Chrysostom, he also says this. This will be my last church father quote. He says, Note the careful timing of their mission. They were not sent out at the beginning of their walk with him. They were not sent out until they had sufficiently benefited by following him daily. It was only after they had seen the dead raised, the sea rebuked, devils expelled, the legs of a paralytic brought to life, sins remitted, lepers cleansed, and had received a sufficient proof of his power by both deeds and words, only then did he send them out? So he gave them all the training they needed. And when he sent them out, he didn't say, all right, now that you watch me, now go out and you're on your own. Jesus did not have a sink or swim mentality to ministry. And so often, that's what we experience in life. That happens in the workplace. That happens in college. And it happens way too often in the church. You know what? You run this ministry. Sink or swim, figure it out. But that's not what Jesus did. He gave them plenty of time to observe and practice alongside of him. And then they were given very specific instructions. You know, I've, I've been learning this as I've had more people that I've been learning to delegate. Sometimes they'll say, hey, can you do this for me? And then they come back and they might have messed up a little. And you know what? It's usually because I didn't give them enough instructions. You know what? These people, they didn't know what Jesus knew, so they needed instructions. And when we uh, have others, we delegate, we're raising up others, they don't know what you know. So you have to give very specific instructions. And you see with Jesus, he gave them very specific instructions. He gave them a very specific task to less people and for a limited amount of time. And when they completed their task, they were to report back to him. So they were still... They're not being kicked out of the nest to be on their own. They're going, in a sense, for practice on their own and then coming back. So it, it's a sad story when the sink or swim mentality happens in the church. Uh, and this happens way too often. Um, someone oftentimes are given a chance to serve, to run a ministry. Let's say, let's say, oh, uh, you can run with VBS this year or something like that. And they blunder their first attempt. Then the ministry is taken away from them, and they never try to serve in that capacity again. It might be years, decades before they try again, or they may never try again. That can have devastating effects on someone. But what Jesus does, he sets up his disciples for success. They've seen it modeled. They've received very specific instructions. And then they're given a chance to serve in a limited capacity and come back to Jesus and report back. So if we want to see others succeed in ministry, we need to learn to prepare people the way Jesus prepared people. And some of you might be thinking, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's worth it. All right, our fourth point, the fourth, fourth step. So Jesus sent the 72 away to minister themselves. And by the way, that really is 72 people up there. I counted. Um, so in Luke 10, verse 1, he says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So first thing to notice here, Jesus, he just brought in the group of people he's training to minister. Now that the broader group of disciples have seen the success of the twelve, they too are more excited to serve as well. And while, while Scripture doesn't share this, I think it's reasonable to believe and to think about this scenario. So think about it. The 72, Jesus' circle was very small. The 72, 
they were well aware of who the twelve were and what they had been sent to do. And they would get to hear the report of the twelve coming back. And now as the 72 are being sent out, you better believe they were talking to the twelve. And they were probably asking things like, what was it like to preach to crowds? I've never preached to a crowd before. Were there really towns where no one would let you stay? How did you handle that? Or was it scary to cast out demons? That was part of their mission, was casting out demons. I'd be scared. I'd be like, Jesus sent me out to cast out demons. How did that go for you? That sounds kind of scary to me. So you better believe the 12 come back. They're reporting back. And now these 72, they get to not only learn from Jesus, but they get to learn from the, those who are senior to them, those who've gone before them. So note again that they're, all, they're likewise sent in pairs. Likewise, their mission was limited in scope. And they reported back to Jesus when they were done. And I'm not going to read it, but we see that later in Luke 10. Now here's an interesting thing to think about. So remember how he said when Jesus first went through all of Galilee, preaching and healing by himself. He had one Jesus to 240 villages. When he sent the 12, you had um, one partnership to every 40 villages. Now that he sends out the 72, you had one partnership for every seven villages. Notice how that ratio is getting smaller. Do you think Jesus was pretty smart? <laughs> Jesus was pretty good at planning. Uh, and he, he did have a plan for this. Now, one thing I want to point out that's very important from the Luke 10 passage is the fact in verse 2, he had them pray for even more laborers. Um, I'm going to read uh, from Matthew 9 where he says the same sort of thing. Matthew 9.35, and I don't think I have it up here, so you'll just have to listen to me. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest." We see this come up a few times in the Gospels, and we see it come up in different places, which usually means this was a regular thing Jesus instructed his disciples to do, just to pray for even more laborers. So that's important for us as we serve, to pray that God would send more laborers, that he would raise up more laborers. And guess what? In the Matthew 9 passage, um, when Jesus has them pray this, he hasn't even sent out the 12 yet. He says, hey guys, can you pray for laborers to be sent in the harvest? And then literally the very next verse, he's like, all right guys, I'm sending you out into the harvest. So oftentimes that happens, say, you pray for God to send out missionaries, and then you might realize, oh, God might be sending me. <laughs> and it might, be, it might not be missionaries in another country, but you might pray, God, I want you to make a difference in this community for Christ. And then you'll soon realize, oh, God wants to send me. <laughs> but pray for more laborers. Now, let's think about this. So going back to Luke, he tells the 72 this as they're going out, as they're preaching. Now, again, there's, two par there's one partnership for every seven villages now. And he's telling them to pray for even more. What's going to happen if you pray for even more? You're going to have even smaller ratio. You're going to have even more uh, ministers per village. You're going to start saturating Galilee. You might get too many people preaching Oh, there's too many preachers in this village. i got to go to find a different village. But as you'll see, Jesus knows it's important to train up more laborers because the good news about the kingdom of heaven, it's about to burst out of the borders of Galilee. It's about to expand. And this is an important point for us as churches to understand. So when it comes to raising up leaders, here's the model of raising leaders that we tend to see in the church. This seems to be the default. So we have certain roles, right? We're like, okay, we have a sound team, a video team. We have a men's ministry. We have a women's ministry. We've got a youth group. We've got a music ministry. You know, we have all these different ministries. And usually we'll have someone who's kind of leading that ministry. Well, let's say someone, they end up moving away. Or 
something happens in their life. They need to step down from the ministry. What do we tend to do? We send, tend to kind of freak out and say, oh, no, who's going to run this ministry? We need to find someone to run this ministry. And then we, we find someone, we beg them to do it, and then they take it. And once the role is filled, we're like, oh, phew. Oh, we can be at peace now. We had someone to fill that ministry. Now, the problem with that is our only sense of raising leaders is, first of all, finding people who we already think are leaders. And then second of all, our only vision is to fill our minimum needs, right? Well, let's, see, let's think about what Jesus is doing. He's growing his team of ministers. He's building them up. They're getting more and more and more. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you have too many. And what happens when you have too many? You've got to send them out. <laughs> Go serve elsewhere, right? And so we don't want to be the type of church that's just filling roles. We want to be the type of church who's discipling people and raising up leaders and calling out the potential within them. And if we do that in our church, this is the problem we want to have. We want to have the problem of having too many trained and too many quality leaders in our church. That's a great problem to have. Because you know what? When the church down the road says, we're really struggling and we really need help, we don't have any teachers, we can say, we can help. We have teachers. We have too many teachers. Take one of our teachers, right? Or let's say, there, we find out there's a bunch of refugees. They come into Grand Rapids. They're about 20 minutes away. And we say, someone needs to minister to them. Where are we going to find people to minister to them? Well, we've got this person and this person and this person. They're ready to go. Let's send them. When we start raising up our people, all of a sudden the ways God can use us starts growing. And so rather than just seeing all oh, How do we keep the status quo? How do we just not fall behind? We need to be thinking ahead. And for our church, we have a very specific opportunity coming up. It's right over there. It's a big old building. It can seat about twice of what we can seat in here. Now, what happens when your church doubles in size and you don't have any more leaders? You get unbalanced. You start looking like an upside-down pyramid. (laughs) And you're going to crash over, right? So if we, we're about to have an opportunity to reach the community in a unique way, and we need to raise up our people now to be ready to minister. All right, so our fifth point, the fifth step in Jesus raising up leaders. When Jesus' earthly ministry was complete, he commissioned his disciples to continue and expand the mission that he started. So Jesus sends out the 11 to the nations. Matthew 20, 18, the Great Commission, a very familiar passage. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So at first, the mission was just Israel, but now it's expanded and it's to the world. And remember, Jesus said that his apostles, he said, you will do greater things than I, right? And do you know what? They did. We, we kind of feel like that's sacrilegious, but that's what Jesus said. He said, you're going to do greater things than I. Jesus' ministry was in a limited scope. And he said, I'm not going to stay here and finish this ministry on my own. You're going to help me. You're going to bust the borders of Israel, and you're going to take this good news to the entire world. And so think about this. When uh, he first called the apostles. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, right? He said, this is what I'm going to do. And here you are, three and a half years later, they've had all the training in the world. They, they got to watch Jesus, practice alongside of Jesus, get sent down there on their short-term missions, and come back and report to Jesus. They have all this training, and now that they're ready, Jesus says, I'm going but I'll be with you always. 
and I'm going to send you to the world. You're going to expand this mission and take it everywhere. So think about that. Three years from fishers of fish to fishers of men. So I have some application for you all. I have quite a bit of application for you all. So uh, the first one, uh, Jesus' example of training leaders needs to be modeled by those who are already leaders. So uh, the, in the, probably in the first place, that's our elders. Our elders need to be raising up leaders like Jesus rose, uh, raised up leaders. And our elders, for our last three or four elders meetings, this has been a major part of our meetings. We've been discussing how can we better raise up leaders like Jesus raised up leaders. So pray for us as we try to lead in that way. And our ministry leaders, if you're leading it within a ministry, look at Jesus' example and think, how can I raise up more people to do what I'm doing? <coughs> Second application, if you want to start raising leaders like Jesus, here's where you start. Start by never ministering alone. Never minister alone. This is the easiest place to start because that's how Jesus started. He just had them go with him. Come with me. Follow me, right? Just do this with me and you can watch me do it. That's the place to start. So if you're serving in any capacity, Start inviting others to serve with you. I don't care what it is. If you're helping prepare food for meals, invite people to help with you. If you're teaching a class, invite someone to start teaching with you. <laughs> um, whatever it may be, if you're um, serving in the community, um, if you're doing evangelism, whatever you may be doing, don't do it alone. Bring others with you. Now, if you are not serving... Find someone who is and say, I want to serve with you. <laughs> I'm not good at evangelism. Can I go with you and watch you do it? I'm not good at teaching, but I think I might want to. Can I see how you prepare your lessons? Can I serve alongside of you? This is the place to start. All right, application number three. Expect this to be an incredibly personal and time-consuming process. So Jesus and the disciples they lived together for most of those three-plus years. Think about that. It was not 90 minutes on a Sunday. This was a lot of face-to-face -face time and shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder time. Um, so Jesus spent over three years with these people because transformation takes time, but it doesn't take forever. So three years, it's, you might think, oh, it seems like a long time, but at the same time, three years go by very, very quickly. So if you could have even one transformational relationship every three years, that will probably be the most impactful ministry throughout your life, is these individual people that you invest in over the course of time. Number four, expect difficulties, challenges, and failures. So I don't know if you've noticed this in the Bible, but Jesus' disciples weren't always easy to lead. <laughs> they often didn't get what he was teaching them. They bickered. They had wrong motives at times. They failed at times, but Jesus stuck with them. So just because you're trying to lead someone, you're trying to uh, pull, draw out their God-given potential, doesn't mean it's going to come out quickly. <laughs> Some, some, we all have rough edges, and some of us have more than others, but it takes time, and there's going to be difficulties and challenges along the way. All right, the fifth thing, expect heartache. So Jesus started with 12, but what did he end up with? 11, because Judas betrayed him. Now, you might not be betrayed and killed like Jesus, but there will be people who break your heart. There will be people you spend months and years with and they just walk away from the faith. And maybe they won't walk away in the from the faith. Some will stay in the faith, but they'll walk away from you. They might get mad at you over something. Part of inviting someone into your life is to invite them into your heart. And while this won't always be the case, there will be times where these people will hurt you, 
the people that you cared so dearly for who leave you behind. So expect heartache. Now, these last few I gave you are kind of depressing. Expect it to be incredibly personal time consuming process, expect difficulties, expect heartache. Well, here's the last one. Expect God-empowered transformation. This is the way Jesus went about his earthly ministry, and it's how we should go about ours. If you want to make an impact, it's going to be made by focusing on individuals. All viral videos and blog posts will end up forgotten. Once best-selling books end up in the dumpster at Goodwill, Large charity donations, they end up spent. But the impact you can make on one person's life, that makes a difference for an eternity. Because people are eternal people. We are eternal beings. So the most important thing you can do is spend those months and years with even one person and seeing the transformation that God wants to make in them through you. So, <clears throat> I started this sermon giving the example of the ants in Fangorn Forest. At one point in the two towers, the ant named Treebeard sees the devastation Saruman has caused, cutting down and burning his beloved forest, and he gathers all the ants to march on Saruman's fortress, and he calls them to action. Now, Gandalf, in the book The Two Towers, he describes this moment saying, But now his long, slow wrath is brimming over, and all the forest is filled with it. Its tide is turned against Saruman and the axes of Isengard. A thing is about to happen, which has not happened since the elder days. Thence are going to wake up and find that they are strong. There are so many pitfalls I see churches falling into today. Some churches, they've lost all sense of their mission and they've become nothing more than a social club. Some churches have become so obsessed with marketing and just filling their seats that they've turned themselves into a consumer product. Some churches have lost sight of Jesus and they've become obsessed with their own man-centered sense of self-righteousness. But if we want to make a difference as a church, I believe the best thing we can do is to do something very, very old. I believe we need to be more like Jesus and start caring about the individual. I believe we need to be more like Jesus and focus on long-term discipleship over short bursts of spiritual excitement. I believe we need to be more like Jesus and not discount people for who they may be now but to call out their God-given potential. I believe when the church starts doing things his way and in his power, that's when the church will wake up and find that it is strong. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming to this earth. And thank you that you didn't just leave us to sink or swim. Thank you for training up the apostles who trained up their disciples, who trained up their disciples all the way till today. Lord, help us to continue your mission. And as a result, may we see the good news of the kingdom of heaven and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ spread throughout the whole world. Help us to be faithful to that mission right here and right now in our community, focusing on one person at a time. It's in your name we pray. Amen.